Welcome back to the CardinalSports.com recruiting chat. I'm your host, Dave Lackford. I'm also your recruiting analyst. And you guys had questions. I answered them. Uh, this is actually the second time I'm answering them because I recorded a version earlier and then I said some stuff and then got some new information like five minutes later that rendered everything I said incorrect. So second take, this one will probably be better than the first and I won't be as wordy and long-winded. All right, so um, right now, 2022 class is in play and they have no recruits committed yet, but that's fine. Louisville usually doesn't really gear up until March. Um, usually they get all their recruits from March to August. That's the, the meat of the schedule. That's when most of the commitments come in and they don't have anybody yet, but um, they will, of course, right? They did have a kid named Caleb Johnson, who's a quarterback from Alabama, okay? And one of the questions I got was from, uh, was from UL Cards 15. He asks, um, you know, can, can I give some details about what is going on with the 2022 QB spot? We had a guy maybe in the fold, but not looking like it will happen now. Well, here's what happened. So I'm going to explain the difference between a uh, committable offer and a non-committable offer, right? So you might say to yourself, how can an offer be non-committable, okay? That's the way it works. There's offer and acceptance. This is law school, law school 101, okay? I offer you something that changes your legal position. And then if the offer is not rescinded and I accept it, you're bound to that offer, right? Well, you gotta also remember that these are verbal offers. These are verbal contracts and a verbal contract is about as good as the paper that it's printed on. So. A non-committable offer is usually extended to, I'd say, the majority of recruits, okay? Not the vast majority, but the majority. Now, if you're a five-star kid, you're the number two quarterback in the country, um, and you get an offer in May, and you commit two days later, the staff is probably going to take your, your commitment and say, great, thanks. But in this case, um, it was different because it was a non-committable offer. That means this. It means that the staff gets together as a whole, looks at a group of players from um, different regions, and then puts them into the position category, okay? Um, so they send out maybe 10 offers for one quarterback spot, and now you have a group of kids that you're considering taking at that one spot. Um, obviously, there's going to be like, you know, if there's a, a number one guy, right? So Louisville offered uh, A.J. Duffy, okay? A.J. Duffy wanted to jump on board. They'd probably take his commitment right then and there. However, that's he didn't do that. But Caleb Johnson saw an opportunity at Louisville to come in and compete right away. And he didn't need to even do anything. He didn't need to come visit. He hasn't taken a virtual visit. I mean, he may have now, but he had it before he announced that he had a commitment date he hadn't talked to Satterfield he doesn't know anything about the school really other than the depth chart I guess so the staff was kind of like whoa whoa pump your brakes um no need to commit right now we want to get to know you better so um that's an that's an, an uncommittable offer is just identifying a player as a prospect amongst another group of prospects that the staff feels can play for their school okay it doesn't mean that they're going to necessarily just take you once you say okay I want to commit right now unless you are that elite prospect there's it's a no-brainer if you're not they're going to want to get to know you better feel you out um, and compare you and get as many data points as they possibly can on the prospect and compare them with the other data points from the other prospects within that pool of players and then make an informed decision on process of elimination right pro con list, whatever. So Caleb Johnson had an uncommittable offer and the coaching staff obviously doesn't say that when they offer you like, Hey, we're going to offer you, but it's a fake offer or we're going to offer you and you can't accept it yet, but um, you have the offer, right? Some coaches will say that some coaches will straight up tell you, look, I'm going to offer you right now. But if I come to watch you play your senior year and you looking like a, a sophomore out there, don't even think about calling me back. Right. I've, I've actually heard coaches say that not at Louisville, but that's that's something that happens. But it's very rare to, to direct technique. Not 
most recruiters don't use that, right? Most recruiters say, hey, man, look, man, uh, we watch your film. We really like you. Look forward to uh, getting to know you more and meeting the family and have you guys come to campus and, and check out what Louisville is all about. Um, and go ahead and you can post on Twitter or Instagram or whatever that you have an offer. Right. And rarely does the kid say, oh, yeah, cool. I'm gonna jump right on board, especially if they uh, they're just starting to heat up in their recruitment and pick up offers like Caleb Johnson is doing right now. And also if they have multiple offers from other schools. Right. And that's why sometimes you may say, why, why hasn't Louisville offered this kid from, you know, the local kid, blah, 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 because they know that if they offer him right away, he's probably he could jump on board instantly and they're not ready to take his commitment yet because they still need to evaluate other players at his position. Um, so the local kids may be a little slow to get offers, but when it's an out of state guy down in Alabama, you know, you want to jump on him and establish a relationship with him before, you know, the Auburns or the world come calling. So that's what happened with Caleb Johnson. He was, he was extended an uncommittable offer. Um, uh, it was more of a relationship building slash we've identified you as a prospect who has the talent to play for us offer, but more due diligence has to be done. So I hope I explained that well in my rambling stream of consciousness style. But um, <clears throat> that's, the, that's the situation with Caleb Johnson. The quarterback position is going to need to be evaluated further because you only get one. They're only taking one in this class. So that's the way it's going to work. You're going to be more, um, you're, you're going to be more discerning, you know, after what happened with Chubba Purdy, I think the staff learned from that. And so I think they're, they want to be sure they have their guy before they accept that commitment. Because once you, once you take that one quarterback, you're done recruiting the position. And, and if you get burned late, you're screwed because it's too late. You, you know, you've, you've, all the other quarterback dominoes have fallen and you're left holding the bag with no other options other than maybe like a transfer student or something like that. So that's where we're at with the quarterback situation in 2020 and Caleb Johnson in particular. All right, let's move on to the next question. It comes from um, Train Zero. He says how he asks how has the staff's recruiting methodology changed now that they have a couple seasons in the ACC under their belt? For example, they seem to be targeting more length and size in the front seven. How else have they shifted as they leave their old Sun Belt mindset behind? Well, um, I, I would want to define what a Sun Belt mindset is because when you're recruiting in the Sun Belt, you kind of think to yourself, all right, we got to get these level kids. Um, and, and so that's when you're competing against the power five, right? You're competing against the ACC, things of that nature, right? I don't know that there's much of a, a, a difference other than now you have that, you jumped into a different realm, but you're still not in the top tier, right? You're still not LSU, you're still not Alabama, you're still not USC, Oklahoma, Clemson, Ohio State. So you still got to kind of, you know, be careful not to waste too many resources on a kid that's going to end up dropping a top five of Oklahoma, Bama, Georgia, and Oregon, right? You, you got to be selective with your time and resources. Um, I think you nailed it when you said that when, when you posed in your question that they've started to focus more on length when they were taking these smaller, quicker um, guys who could penetrate the line of scrimmage, right? I mean, that's all well and good at App State because you're, you're kind of, that's the dudes that are left, right? But when you're in the ACC, it's like, well, yeah, you, you got to get the big guys who are uh, able to penetrate and are quick as well. So um, I think they've learned that and that's why they've kind of shifted gears away from that philosophy of let's go after these uh, small penetrative type players and let's, let's get more traditional. Um, but they definitely had that mindset going in and now, you know, they're, they're kind of like, uh Oh, we got to get some more length. You know, they're, they need more length everywhere and they, they've been getting it. So they've learned from that. Um, they learned from the quarterback scenario that I went through just a minute ago and talking about, you know, you get this guy, I got to make sure don't just jump on Don't let anybody just jump on make sure that you got him locked down. Um, so that's, that's one way. And they're not all Sunbelt mentality people. I mean, Court Dennison was here at Louisville and then he went to Oregon and then he came back, right? Derek Nicholson, uh, was never in the Sunbelt. Maybe he was, um, but you know, he's the guy that goes after the big fish. He's an angler, um, Gunnar Brewer, Brew, coach Brew. He was at North Carolina. He was in the NFL, you know, he wasn't on the Sunbelt staff and a lot of those guys are going now. Right. So, um, you know, you saw it in 2020 
when they, I think they had like nine kids that only had a committable or that, that didn't have a committable offer from any other power five school. And, and this year that was not the case. Like every, every kid they got had at least one other power five school that they could have went to. So you're, you're seeing it, you're saying it's a slow progression. Um, but I, I think you're seeing a, a lot of, um, you're seeing it trend the right way. So yeah, I hope that answers your question, Train. Uh, Sabres. Do you foresee who do you foresee as our first commit in the 2022 class? Um, I, I uh, was asked about that, and I was told um, once somebody once somebody comes available, once somebody's about to pop or whatever, I'll be the first to know. But right now, such is not the case. There isn't anybody that's like on the verge of committing right now. It, it was Caleb Johnson, but I already detailed what that was about. And then Sabers asks. Of the prospects on our big board, who stands out the most to you as the guy we have to land? I think in, in this offense, it's running back. Uh, you saw how invaluable Javion Hawkins was to the whole scheme. Uh, I was told a while back, you know, look, we just want a home run threat at running back because it's harder to score with more plays, right? I mean, it sounds basic, but it's right. So you got this home run back who can pick up 50 yards for you or score from the, your own 40 that gets the points on the board right so to me I like Dylan Sampson all right and I'm going to show you why I'm going to share my screen with y'all and let you look at this kid and I want to explain to you why he's my guy all right and it's going to be just one highlight okay this is him right here uh, he shows me the total package in this he shows me explosion. He shows me wiggle. He shows me vision. He shows me balance. All right. So just watch the play. All right. Why, why, why does that show me everything? Well, he's standing next to the quarterback. He gets the ball one, 1,000. He's, already four yards up the field look at that and and it's vision like he's he's already made a move he's found he's located the hole now he gets in the hole he's too fast for this guy to grasp he identifies this block down field right here and then he has to make a decision do i cut outside or do i cut inside it looks like he can't tell right now because it's, it's pretty squared up so you'd want to bounce outside but number 11 is coming so he, he sets it up outside. This guy gets free. His outside shoulder becomes free. Uh-oh, he reacts. He bounces into this man right here, right, with a jump cut. And then watch this. See the, see the, the burst, see the explosion and the balance there and the spin move? That's all just feeling. He just felt that out. He felt that out right there. That guy right there flashed colors. You're going to see the kid flash right here. He feels him. He spins out here into daylight. Everything's outside now. Look at that setup. And he pressed the line of scrimmage, too. It's another thing that you want to do as a running back. You know, you want to press the line of scrimmage. He just blows up the line of scrimmage. It sucks everybody inside. C number 11, C number four, he's pressing that line of scrimmage. Boom. Bounces off, absorbs the blow. I see a lot of Jay Hawk in this kid. I really do. I like him. And he's fast as Jay Hawk. And you say, Dave, come on, man. How are you going to say this kid's as fast as Jay Hawk? Look at that explosion right there. How are you going to say this kid's as fast as Jay Hawk? Jay Hawk might have been the fastest dude Louisville's ever had, right? He ran a 4 3 6 at the opening. Um, well, a lot of people think, oh, this kid looks fast on film. Uh, but you don't really know what you're talking about unless you're like uh, someone who is a trainer and you understand stride length, you understand turnover. A lot of coaches understand that, right? I've talked to some coaches who don't <laughs> believe it or not, but if you don't know how to discern stride length and turnover, and I've been doing this for some time and I still, I'm like, I, I don't really know that I can do that. One thing I'll do is I'll cheat. I'll go to mile split. So I'll look up Dylan Sampson on mile split and see if he's got a track time and he does. So I'm going to look him up. Dylan Sampson. There he is. 6.9 and a 60 meters. That's fast, man. That's real fast. Actually, is this the right kid? <laughs> Hold on. Let me make sure I got the right kid. Uh, yeah, get some more Louisiana. This is the right kid, all right? I thought Dylan was from Georgia, but he's from Louisiana. You see here in the 60 meters, he ran a 6.9. 
All right, that's fast. But how fast is that, right? Like, who are you measuring it against? How do you know that uh, 6.9 is faster than the 60 meters? Dave, you ain't no track guy. I'm not. But I know Rondell Moore is fast, right? I know Rondell Moore is very fast. And I know Rondell Moore is going to be playing in the NFL. So how fast is, is Rondell Moore? Well, he ran a he ran a 6.89 in the 60 meter dash. Now I know for a fact he ran that going into his senior season. But if you look at this, indoor starts in January, February, right? When it's cold outside. He ran this last year, going into his junior year. He ran a 6.9. You can see the progression. 2019, he ran a 7.31. He shaved four tenths of a second off his time with that 6.9. That kid's fast. That means like he couldn't run it this year because he sprained his ankle really bad. But he's better now and he's back training. He could have ran a 6.83, right? Which would have been faster than Rondale Moore's time. Rondale Moore, for comparison, when we were uh, back when they were all in high school, Rondale ran a 4-3-3 at the opening, right? Jayhawk ran a 4-3-6 at the opening. Rondale was faster than Jayhawk. And right here you see that there is a, a, what is it, a hundredth of a second difference between Rondale Moore and, and Dylan Sampson. So uh, Dylan is the Jayhawk. That is the guy who's very similar to Jayhawk. He's, he's 5'10", 175, I believe Jayhawk. It's probably 5'8", 175. People say Jay Hall is 5'10". I don't, I don't, I don't, yeah, okay. But uh, so that's that's the most important guy for me. I think that they, they need this breakaway running back with this long speed and burst. And I think that and, – and this kid has all that. He's got, the, he's got the short explosion and he got the long speed to get out, right? So there we go. That's, that's the thing that I look at. I look at the 60 – 55 preferably – with the 60 because it's the closest track time to a 40 and it's laser right so kids will tell you oh i ran a four four five no you didn't man your coach times you and lied you know what i mean but that that track time that mile split that's official that's official as run by the state the kid goes in high school and it's all on a laser so that is a real representative of how fast the kid is and then I can measure that 60 meter time with another kid who I know is fast like Rondell Moore. Rondell will always be my my bar. I just use Rondell because I know the kid's freaking fast as hell. So I like the Samson kid from Louisiana. I think he'd be a huge pickup. I spoke with him. He said that he's been in touch with the new running back coach and uh, that's a good sign because you know North left. He went down to Vanderbilt and um, they hired the, the rail guy from ECU and he's already on the phone talking to this kid from Louisiana. That's big. Um, it's a quick transition to me. That tells me that, um, that the staff has identified this kid as the, one of the top priorities. I don't know if he's the top, but he's one of the top priorities and the staff has given the new running backs coach a mandate to hey, stay on this guy. So, that would be my favorite recruit in the 21 class. If they could get this kid, that would be my, you'll say, hey, Dave, who's your favorite 2022 guy? Dylan Sampson from Louisiana. That's my guy. He fits the offense and he does the things that Jayhawk did in high school. He actually looks a little bit more shiftier than Jayhawk, but uh, Jayhawk was more like uh, just Jayhawk. Jayhawk's thing was just his explosion. And his, his, he was a little tank, you know, he would hit people, he was rocked up. And when people would hit him, he kind of bounced off. And you saw that with Dylan on that spin move, you know, he jump cuts to the middle of the field, feels the, you know, feels the, the, the impact from that guy and is able to spin and, you know, pick up steam from the hit. And that's something that I saw Jay Hawk do a lot. So I like that kid. I like Jay Hawk. Jay Hawk's my favorite recruits and players that ever came through. So uh, hopefully that, that my boy gets drafted high. Um, shout out to Jay Hawk. Shoot 677 asks, who are our big time defensive targets for this upcoming class? Uh, I'd say the most big time target would be um, this kid named uh, uh, Sebastian Cheeks. He's from Tennessee. 
He's like a, a high four star. He's like right around the 100 level uh, in the rivals 250 rankings. He's probably going to Notre Dame though, but I know the staff is in contact with him. The Wade twins would be big. They're also from Tennessee. One's a quarterback slash athlete. I think the other one is a linebacker, outside linebacker. Keaton Wade is his name. Um, so he's he's a guy. Stone Blanton is another kid that'd be a big pickup. He's in the Jack Dingle mold. He's a beast. He's a inside linebacker from down in Mississippi. Uh, Langston Peterson is another inside linebacker prospect from Tennessee. So he's another guy that um, would be a big pickup for Louisville. Obviously, Selah Brown, four star here at Mail. He'd be a big time pickup. Uh, Marcus Allen. He's a uh, six foot three cornerback from, I want to say Georgia. He'd be a big pickup. Um, so those are the, those are the, the big time guys. Uh, the staff is also in on Popeye Williams, who's an outside linebacker prospect from Indiana. He's a 5.73 star, uh, really good athlete, good, good, uh, good explosion off the ball for an outside linebacker and a uh, good frame. He's going to be a kid that's a big kid. I've seen him. I saw him during the pandemic first started. I saw him out in Ohio when I was working with the Ohio State site. So um, I think that he's a kid that they could get. He's got a virtual visit. Either he already took the virtual visit here or he has one coming up. I'm not sure. I know he's taken virtual visits or has them coming up with Michigan State and Nebraska. He also mentioned Alabama, but I think that was kind of like a clout thing. I, I don't know that uh, Bama is a legit option for him. Um, so I think the, the top three for Popeye right now would be Louisville, Nebraska, and Michigan State. And um, I know that the staff has been recruiting Popeye pretty hard. So those are the guys to watch right now. Oh, and then at, uh, at cornerback, there's a kid down at Grayson named um, uh, Mumu Bin Wahad. He plays with, uh, he played with Vic Tone Brown, uh, Vic Tone Brown. I think that he's the kid the staff's high on and, and he's high on Louisville. <clears throat> um, also, there's a kid named uh, Kawan Banks, who's from Tallahassee, who the staff likes at strong safety. And then there's a free safety named uh, Jalen Lewis. He's a six foot one, um, 180 pound free safety that the staff likes. So those, those are the guys that are on my radar right now as, um, you know, the, the higher ranked uh, uh, kids who the, the staff is, is on hard and they have a legit shot with. All right. Bob West asks with class of 19 holdovers, how many scholarships are open? The dreaded how many scholarship question. This is my, this is my least favorite question ever um, because you hardly ever get a straight answer and you never know what attrition is going to take place. But for right now, I've been told 12 to 15. So it's going to be a very, very small class. And I say, and I think it's probably going to be on the, the low end of the guideline, as we, as we say in federal criminal defense, you know, um, the low end of the guideline is what you want. If your guy's uh, taking a plea deal, you, you want to get the low end because it can range from 31 months to 42 months. And you want the 31 months, not the 42 months. In this case, you want the 15 signees, not the 12, but I think we're looking at the low range of the scale here. I think it's going to be 12 to 13. So I'll go position by position with it. Quarterback, one. Wide receiver, probably one. Let's just say the minimum what I think it's going to be. So quarterback, one. Receiver, one. Running back, one. Tight end, one. Offensive line, probably two tackles, right? So that's going to give us six on offense. Then on defense, I'm going to say one DN, one D tackle, right? So that puts us at eight. Two linebackers, that puts us at 10. One corner, that puts us at 11 and two safeties. So that puts us at 13. I think you're looking at about 13 kids. Now, if they miss on a tight end, maybe they, they take two corners or three offensive linemen. Um, but I don't know. They, they might shift around with corners and safeties. They might take an extra linebacker, but the, those are the numbers. 12 to 15, probably more like 13, possibly 14 maybe 12 or 15, but I, I'm going to just call it 13 right now. So it's going to be a small class and that's the position breakdown. Again, one QB, one receiver, one running back, one tight end, two offensive linemen. They might say, Dave, 
why, why are you taking a tight end? They got two last cycle. Well, they offered a ton of tight ends this cycle. So I'm assuming if they've offered a bunch, they're taking one. And all of their alignment have pretty much been tackles they've offered. Um, and if you miss at the tackle, you just got a long guard or a center. So they'll probably go for two offensive tackle type dudes. And then, you know, they've offered, they've offered DNs, they've offered D tackles, they've offered outside, inside, corners, and safeties. So I'm, I, I'm pretty sure they want a free safety and a strong safety. And then I think they, they want one corner, maybe two. And then I think maybe one, maybe two or three linebackers outside, inside, they'll figure that out when they get there. So that's where we're at with that. Okay. Hope, and that'll probably all get blown out of the, the you know, as soon as I upload this to YouTube, it'll change. But that's where we're at at the time I answered this question. Jay Hectus, are we going to get an early commit to be the leader of the class like Vic Chuan Brown was for us? Um, I don't know, man. Uh, it would have been that Caleb Johnson kid, probably, but, you know, he, he ain't coming here right now. They told him to hold off. That doesn't mean he's not going to come, though. He might, he might be the guy. You remember Derek Edwards from Coco down in Florida? He was supposed to commit, had the article all written up, and, and something happened where the brakes were pumped. And he ended up committing back on uh, July 17th. So, no, June 17th. He committed on June. And, and I had the article written up in, like, April, I think. So you never know. It might just be a couple months, and then he jumps on. And, you know, obviously he likes Louisville because he was ready to commit sight unseen and without talking to Satterfield. So maybe he will be the guy. But, you know, the early dudes usually are vocal. Um, so I would say, you know, are we going to get it for sure? Who knows, man? I wish I could answer that question. I wouldn't be sitting here talking to y'all. I'd be doing something more important, like, you know, when's the next terror strike going to hit, you know? But um, I would say there's a good chance. Uh, Cardinal Cash, where do we stand with Selah Brown and Travion Longmire? Are either committing soon? Selah announced he was um, going to commit on October, I think, 10th. And Travion Longmire, I think, is going to let things play out a little bit longer. I think that we stand um, – I think Louisville stands in a good spot with Selah Brown. Um, that Northwestern just offered him, and he continues to pick up a few offers. But I think the four schools that Selah is looking at the hardest right now would be uh, Louisville, um, Missouri, Stanford, and Virginia. Now, Virginia doesn't make sense to me because if you're going to – commit to an ACC school, why, why would you go to Virginia over Louisville, right? They're basically the same school. I mean, not the same school, but they're like the same level and you wouldn't have to leave home. And in Virginia, Charlottesville isn't like Miami beach. You know what I mean? Like if Miami was, if I was choosing between Miami and Louisville and I was a Louisville kid, I'd, I'd be like, all right, well, that's Miami beach. You know what I mean? Like if, if I'm, if I'm at my favorite wing place, right. Which is, uh, wing station across in Shively across the street from Butler high school, I would be eating my 20 piece with the lemon pepper, with the Buffalo drizzle on it. And I get a call from some law firm in Miami, like, Hey, we, you're hired to come down here. I wouldn't even finish eating my chicken wings, man. I, I wouldn't even pack. I would just hit the airport and call it a day. Right. But that's not me. This is, that's the Selah's decision. But my point is what's the difference between Virginia and Louisville, right? Um, they're they're kind of, they're kind of, you know, comparable schools, so why leave home to go to freaking Charlottesville, Virginia? Uh, Stanford's all the way across the country, uh, great academic school, but, you know, I, I tend to think local Kentucky kids usually don't go far out of state. Now, S Stephen Heron was the exception to that rule. He went to Stanford, but ever since he was a kid, Stanford was always the goal for him because he was a high academic kid, and, and he's kind of Hollywood, you know. Selah's not Hollywood like that. Selah's a gritty kid, you know, I, I don't know. Now, Missouri, I think, is a, a possibility. Why, you say, well, Dave, why Missouri? You know, what's so much different between Missouri and Louisville? Well, Missouri's in the SEC, and that's the difference. It's not an ACC school. It's an SEC school. So the film for scouts is a little bit different because you're going up against top competition. Or not, I don't want to say, I don't say it like that to disrespect the ACC, but come on, man, most, most draft picks – the SEC puts the most kids in the NFL than anywhere else. So it's like NFL light as far as, you know, the talent evaluation goes. And, and that matters, you know, if, unless you're just some kind of, you know, Randy Moss freak who doesn't matter where you go to school. <laughs> but um, that's where I think would be the most, the, I think Missouri is a compromise from Stanford because it's not as far away. 
Um, and it's it's not the ACC, but I still like Louisville. I put my pick in for Louisville. I think Louisville's going to get him. He's been here 50,000 times He's at every game. He knows his staff. They've picked up their efforts on him. I, I like Louisville here. Uh, Longmire, he's being recruited as an athlete type of guy. I know that they have, they're thinking about him at receiver and um, they're looking at him as a DB. I know the, the new guys that came in on the defensive side uh, have been looking at him. The new safeties coach has been looking at him. So uh, look at him. I, I think he'd probably come in as a safety prospect. So keep an eye on him. Not sure. Uh, I got to talk to him. I'll, I'll stand by on that Cardinal cash. I'll get back with you later. Um, so that's that. And then he asks, uh, Cardinal Cash says for QB, I'm assuming Winsat is a no-go. So are we still looking at Caleb Johnson as a likely guy, but the staff is wanting to make sure he's solid before accepting that commitment? I'm not sure that Wimsat is a no-go. Um, I, I just, the kid went dark on me. I haven't spoken to him for a while. Um, and, you know, I don't know where the staff is on him either. I mean, the last time that kid played a game, was in the state championship and he didn't he he didn't do very well. He threw a lot of interceptions and his team got blown out and they really couldn't move the ball that well. But I spoke to other coaches and and, and people who, who are in the know there and they were like that that game is not a representation of what get Wimsat is as a player. Uh, he just had a bad game and you don't just hold his entire body of work hostage based on one poor performance, albeit in the, in the state championship game. But um, I don't know. I don't know that he's a no-go. I don't know that uh, he's the number 50 player in the country either. I think he's a little uh, ranked too high, but I'm not sure. I don't want to write him off yet, okay? So don't write off Wimsat as a no-go. still too early. Um, and I've already explained about the Caleb Johnson situation that he, he they're still, like, recruiting him. They just told him to hold off because you haven't even talked to the head coach yet. Card blood. With this being a smaller class, how do you see the position breakdowns? I just went through that. Rewind. Um, card for life 32. Any insight on the QB recruiting? Do we have a shot with any of the in-state kids? I've went over the, in, the quarterback recruiting um, pretty well. Um, they're still offering kids. They just offered the kid from Texas. Um, and they're, they're, they're still evaluating that, that pool of players at the position. Do we have a shot with any in-state kids besides Sela and Jadarion from Ballard? All right. Good question. Yes. Um, so remember in the beginning, I said I had to redo this entire thing because I screwed up. Well, it was because I said I don't think they're recruiting Dane Key. Come to find out, Dane Key is uh, the guy that they like. He's like their top target um, in, 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 in this class. Um, I was told they really like him as a, as a person. Uh, like, like he's great attitude, hard worker, just uh, all the intangible stuff you want, you know, um, a lot of upside and he's an in-state dude, you know, so um, Dane Key is a guy to keep an eye on, you know, Kentucky's going to try to come hard for him. He's from Frederick Douglass <clears throat> and uh, Kentucky does a good job recruiting Frederick Douglass. They got Jagger Burden, they got Tekel Crowdis. Those are uh, Dane's boys, but um Bear in mind that uh, Dane plays receiver and Kentucky doesn't throw the ball very well. So watch out for Dane Key. Um, another kid in state that they could get is, um, I wouldn't, like I said, I wouldn't count out Wimsat entirely. Uh, Keontae Goodwin is not in state, but he's, he's in Indiana now. I think if, to be realistic, I think his top four right now would be Alabama, um, Louisville, uh, Ohio State, Kentucky, not in that order, but uh, Louisville, Louisville turns the heat up and makes him the number one priority and just really, really spends the resources, you know, the time and the, and the energy and the visits and all that stuff. Um, I, I think that they could, they could land Keontae Goodwin and y'all know I'm plugged into that situation. So Bama's come on hard, uh, but there's some distance there. Ohio State is also a legitimate contender, um, as is Kentucky. But I think Keontae and the people in his circle kind of want him to stay home. Um, 
and uh, they know that he can get to the league regardless. Doesn't matter. Kid, like I said, the freak Randy Moss guy, you know, and Makai Becton is pretty much the protocol of what Keontae Goodwin is. You know, he's a, a big freak size kid who can move, but uh, had fluctuating weight issues. But Louisville was able to, um, you know, put him through the process and get him drafted in the top 10 of the NFL draft. So uh, maybe 11, I forget, but, you know, that's there, the blueprints there and they notice and they want it, but uh, Louisville just got to step up their recruiting efforts a little harder. And I think they, they can pull Keontae Goodwin, which would be a huge recruiting win. I mean, it'd be the flagship recruit for the Satterfield uh, staff slash era. So how about that? Who else is, who else is in state this year? This is a bad year for in-state recruiting. It is not that good. Let's take a look real quick. I didn't do this on the other one because I didn't care because I just kind of wrote this class off this year and figured, you know, they don't really have a lot of top dudes. In my opinion, there's like five, five really good prospects. And then it kind of just like hits a cliff, you know, like if you ever walked out into like a, a, a lake pond, or even a beach and you're, you're walking and then all of a sudden it just drops off. Like that's the, that's the talent pool here this year in Kentucky. Let's take a look. Um, that's 2021. Give me a second. All right. So Wimsack Grant Bingham is an offensive tackle from uh, Johnson Central out in Paintsville. I think he's a kid that's going to either end up at like uh, Kentucky, West Virginia, maybe Notre Dame. I don't know. Selah, we've already talked about Selah Brown. Dane Key, we talked about him. Travion Longmire, talked about him. Then you got Caleb Perry, who doesn't have an offer from Louisville. None of these kids have offers from Louisville. So I don't know. Jadarion, um, Stay tuned on him. I don't know. I told you it's a small class. They prefer more length than that. Um, um, there's some question as to is Jadarion, you know, 6'4", six, 6'3"? Six, is he 6'1"? I think the kid's like 6'2 and a half or whatever. So I don't know that he's necessarily a kid who could jump on board if he wanted to at this point in time. Could be, though. Uh, who's the top guy on the board for the staff at running back and wide receiver? Uh, I want to say Dylan Sampson is the top guy, but I'd be guessing he's his new running back coach. He might be given the uh, leeway to go out and kind of find his own guy. But I know that the staff has told him, you know, keep in touch with this Dylan Sampson kid from Louisiana. He's fast. And he is. Um, receiver is Dan Key. Um, and then Ty Cards Niner says, also you call Jalodi being underrated in one of the prior recruiting chats. Coaches seem to be talking about him at every presser. All right, before I sing my praises about how I said Jalodi was underrated, um, I want to throw out a caveat, and that's uh, take whatever coaches say about early enrollee recruits with a grain of salt when it's February or January, right? <laughs> because, because they just recruited the guys and they have to generate hype for recruiting. So if they, you know, they're going to be asked which new early enrollees look good and they're just going to start throwing out names about everybody looks good because they're not going to say, Oh man, we recruited this kid. He wasn't what we thought he was. We probably shouldn't have taken him. Right. No, no. But uh, I think Jalodi, the reason why Jalodi um, gets praise and the reason why I said he was underrated is because he's like Liam Neeson, you know, he has a very particular set of skills, right? A very specific set of skills. And that skill is the most valuable skill you can have on defense, which is putting pressure on a quarterback because it puts the clock on every other facet of the play. That means think about a pass play, right? Think about the, the, the basic stuff that you take for granted, right? The snap has to be right. The quarterback has to catch the snap. The quarterback has to drop back, right? You got to know his drop. Uh, he got to know his keys, his reads. The offensive line has to block correctly. The receivers have to get off the press. Uh, they have to get open. Uh, they have to run the right route. The quarterback has to see the coverage and then throw an accurate pass. The receiver has to catch it. When you have a guy screaming off the edge in a beeline for the quarterback, that puts the pressure and it on on everything to be executed properly and quickly or else a quarterback's going to get sacked or throw an errant pass. You can get a turnover. Okay. Just mansplained what getting quarterback pressure is. I'm sure you all knew that, but that skill is devastating 
when it can't be stopped. And so if you have a kid that comes in with his hair on fire and none of the guys can block him, you're going to give him praise. And that's the thing that he does well is that one specific thing. That's why the Giants beat Tom Brady and the Patriots and cost me $500 back when the Patriots were undefeated because they couldn't stop the pass rush, right? So um, that's why I like Jalodi because I knew he had that one skill set. Nothing else matters. I don't care what the kid, you could throw the ball to him a hundred times and he couldn't catch it. He might not be able to jump over a piece of paper on the ground, but if he can rush the passer, he's a, the most valuable commodity you can have on defense. And I thought that the kid had a really good first step and a good bend and plays with a tenacity. He's crazy. So he's, he's your guy, you know, he's shock troop. He's the first kid taking the beach. So that's why I liked him. And um, maybe the staff, staff also talking good about Ben Perry, right? They're saying Ben Perry's doing good things. And I always said that was my favorite recruit in the class. So I said underrated was Jalodi. And I said that uh, my favorite guy was Ben Perry. Both of them are receiving praise. But as I said, be careful about that preseason praise because they're, you know, they ain't going to come out and be like, oh, that kid got some work. I don't know. He's probably going to be in the portal next year. <laughs> you know what I mean? So uh, beware. Buyer beware. Caveat emptor. Um, card fan 59. In the 2021 class, ranking this. Is, is the 2021 class ranking the ceiling for this staff at Louisville, or do you think they can do better? Uh, they were ranked 27th this year. So, yeah, they can do better. They get 26, 25, 24. <laughs> um, but, I mean, I take this class ranking with a grain of salt anyway. Like, rivals kind of just sat down on what they had and didn't really see a lot of movement, um, and they finished 27th. 24-7 – said, all right, we don't have any camps. Half these kids ain't playing games. Let's do a deep dive into their film. What do you mean a deep dive into their film? You weren't deep diving into their film before? This is the first time you're doing a deep dive into the film? What did, what did, did you actually go watch a game where uh, one kid is from one side of town and he played another top tier team from the other side of town. And, and you looked at the rivals film and said, Oh, he didn't have a good game against them. What do you mean? A deep, what the hell is a deep dive? You should have done that to begin with. If there's no new data, you don't change the rankings. This is pseudoscience, but it still has, has to have some kind of methodology to it. That makes sense. It's like, uh, what are we talking about here? So rivals kind of stayed where they were and these are old rankings and um, kids could have grown, could have gotten a lot better, could have gotten a lot worse. So is this class really the 27th ranked class in the country? No, it might be the 50th ranked. It might be the 15th ranked. I don't know, but I wouldn't take, I take this number, I take the 2021 signing class with the grain of salt because it occurred in a freaking pandemic. Half these kids didn't even get to visit the schools. So all of them, none of them got to visit the schools unless they did it before the pandemic happened, right? So. Take, take it with a grain of salt. Um, and yeah, I think that you could always do better. You know, always strive to be better. Thailand 06. I feel we need a stud inside linebacker in this class after missing out guys on guys like Jaden Hood and Jack Dingle in last class and Prince Kali. Uh, do you have any, any idea of the prospects on the board the staff has offered and who you could see a good fit? Yeah, I went through that already um, with the inside linebacker dudes. I like Stone Blanton. I like Langston Peterson. Those are the two inside linebackers that I think will fit really well in this scheme. Uh, Raylan Wilson is another kid. Uh, uh, who else am I thinking about here? Who I forget. Uh, the Keaton Wade kid would be a huge pick up uh demario tolan would be a good guy um but it's just too early to tell right now um but you know i i think that uh peterson and blanton are the two top guys for the inside linebacker spot what o-line prospects are we looking good for believe it or not can say good one if they pick up to put the pressure on him i'm telling you man this is what i've been told from his trainer, Chris Vaughn. You know, I wish they would recruit him harder. Keontae wants them to recruit him harder. He, they, they would love to go there, you know, but it's just it, the, the, and at the end of the day, Keontae could just walk in there, even if he's not recruited and be like, yo, I'm, I'm committing here. Like I'm, I'm staying home. And it's not like they're going to turn him away. 
You know, they're looking good for Keontae. They just need to they need to pick up the pressure. The same way they the same way they put an emphasis on Cela Brown, they need to do the same thing for Keontae Goodwin. Um, I don't know any other offensive line prospects because it's still early and I tend to wait on on that and and um see what other schools are are starting to feel feel out fill out their offensive line. Because you saw what happened with uh, with the Zen kid from Indiana, right? Um, Ohio State was after some top tier guys. They were after like Tristan Lee and and a few players of that nature, and they all went to other schools. And so once those players were off the board, they just went and plucked Zen Zen right from Louisville staff. And um, that's what you gotta kind of be mindful of. Like you may look good for a kid now who's kind of like uh, you know under the radar. But O-line, O-line is money, man. You know, remember when I said the DN has that particular set of skills that can wreck your whole offense? Well, you know, how do you counter that? You counter that with a good tackle. So uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you have that skill set where you can neutralize that threat coming off the edge, you are also top commodity. That's why you see, you know, the, the top positions in football are quarterback, DN, O-tackle, and then, you know, probably either corner or wide receiver. Those are the top positions in, in football right now. And then, you know, D-tackle would come after that. But I don't know. Long-winded way of saying uh, it's too early. Jay Hectus, who are the top options at running back? I want to say Damari Austin and um, Dylan Sampson, Victor Venn are the guys that I'm familiar with right now. Um, Damari Austin is a high Fort Rivals 250 kid from Atlanta, but he's got big-time offers like Georgia – Ohio State so I think I think he's like you know he might be a kid though that doesn't really care about all that big time stuff he he told me that you know Louisville's still in contention they're legitimate contenders he wants to take a lot of visits before he's able to commit he's one of those kids that's very vocal about the fact that they won't lift the ban actually he was pretty mad that they pushed it till May they extended the dead period from April to May the end of May, May 31st so uh, he wants to get on campus and check some things out he's a kid you could you could steal from a bigger school I think uh, he saw what he saw what Jameer Gibbs did down in uh, Georgia Tech. You know, Jameer was a big time player, and he could have went to a lot of different schools, but he he stayed home, went to Georgia Tech, and was really really good as a true freshman. They got hurt, which is sad because they used him too much. But um, he sees what can happen if you go to the right school, get the right fit. So um, I think Austin's uh, prospect to watch, but Dylan Sampson's my guy just based on body type speed and fit in the offense. I think he's Jayhawk and Jayhawk was a hell of a player here at Louisville. Maybe one of the best Louisville's ever had to play running back. You know what I'm saying? Maybe better than Michael Bush. Who knows? Um, who is the highest rated recruit we actually have a chance with? Says S.E.K. Chow. I like to actually have a chance with. Keontae Goodwin. That's the answer to that. Um, Cardo Mike. Man, this is a long one. Whew. Appears to be a lot of momentum for Selah. With more and more people feeling good about his recruitment. That's that's Trav Graf. <laughs> maybe, maybe there's some other people out there, but Trav is the only other dude at Rivals that put in a pick. Sounds like the staff has built a strong relationship. I'd expect him to be a difference maker. Mail has usually been good to Lou the Ville. My question, though, in your professional opinion, how many Chick-fil-A sandwiches does a typical recruit consume on a visit? Uh, uh, recruits on a, on a camp visit are allowed to be fed by the school because they're camping. They're exerting physical energy so the school can provide food. That's usually like a cater type deal where it'll be, you know, like bag lunch kind of deals. Like if you've ever been, if you've ever been to boot camp in the Marine Corps or any other boot camp, when you first get there, they kind of give you these Jimmy Dean like sandwiches and stuff like that. It's not like Jimmy Dean, but it comes in a little box. Uh, you open it up, it's got the chips, the sandwich, you know, anything you would go get at like a seminar somewhere, whatever. That's kind of what they do. Um, or they give you Papa John's, right? I've never seen Chick-fil-A in a camp. Um, if it's an unofficial visit, school can't provide you with anything. You can like drink out of a water fountain, I think. That's it. You can't, the school cannot provide you with anything on an unofficial visit. You have to pay for it yourself. And then on official visits, um, 
they take the kids out to like Jeff Ruby's and stuff like that. They take you, they take you to the nice spots, you know? Um, so there's that. Tron, a legacy. With no one running away with the starting nose tackle position, um, do we address it in a transfer portal or do we go after a big name in the 2022 recruiting cycle? Tron, I mean, you always want to go after a big name in the recruiting cycle, right? It's just, do you get the kid in the recruiting cycle, right? You always want to go after a big name. That's it. Bama's going after the big names. Clemson's going after the big names. Ohio State's going after the big names. Notre Dame, Oklahoma, USC, Georgia, whatever, LSU, Auburn, Texas A&M. Um, but if it's an immediate need and no one's running away with it and you're going to put something subpar on the field, you want to go grad transfer. That's the way to go. You go grad transfer because that plugs the hole. Um, you get a serviceable guy that's not really going to hurt you. Uh, or you go to, uh, you know, the transfer portal. So I'd say if, and I'm not saying it is, but I'm saying if nose tackle is a problem, the hierarchy would be grad transfer because that fixes the problem. Transfer portal, that probably fixes the problem when kids don't have to wait a year now. And uh, well, most kids don't. And then um, recruit is a kid that doesn't come till next year and you got to groom him. So there you go. Beantown card. These... These are great questions. These are great questions. Are there answer in our future? That is not a great sentence, being town card, but I'm answering it right now. But I'm never answering yours since you want to ask me passive aggressive stuff. <laughs> Just kidding, being town, ask away. Card fan 59, favorite 2021 signee, uh, Ben Perry for sure. And we have come to the end of the recruiting chat. So hopefully that wasn't too long. It was my second one. I tried to be brief. Um, any other questions you guys have that uh, about what I've said here today or that you may have forgotten to ask in the chat, go ahead, drop down in the, in the threads, ask away. I'll do my best to answer them, but this is where we stand. Uh, hopefully things get more busy here, uh, busier here in uh, March April, May, you know, June, and when the camps start, you know, that's usually when the commitments start flowing. But um, even last year, without the camps, that's when all the commitments came in, came in over the summer. Louisville usually has the class wrapped up by August. Um, the class size may impact that. They may be a little bit more selective this year um, or, or not. I mean, maybe it doesn't have an impact at all. I don't, I don't foresee it having much of an impact. Probably it makes them want to get the class wrapped up a lot sooner in case the kid flips. They can go out and put all the focus on the spot they lost. You know what I mean? But um, that's where we're at with it. If you guys have any questions, ask in the thread. Thanks for subscribing and watching this video. Peace.